Hi, everybody. My name is Larry Zwier, and I am an associate director at the English Language Center at Michigan State University. And I'm very happy to be here today on behalf of Cambridge as part of the, the Grammar Day uh, to tell you a little bit of my recent reading and uh, thinking about vocabulary, grammar, and topic sentences. Uh, some of you may know that Cambridge puts out an online grammar newsletter for ESL and EFL teachers. Uh, you, should, you should definitely subscribe to it. Um, it's a great place where we hash out interesting little uh, twists and turns in grammar, and we notice what's, what's coming up uh, among teachers now, what teachers, what are teachers wrestling with? And one of the things that um, our readers wrestle with is handling topic sentences in a relatively new environment where uh, teachers are starting to rethink what they tell their students about writing. Let's have a little look here at some text. Read through that. See if you can answer the question. Where's the topic sentence? Well, if we were in a room together, I'm sure there would be hands up all over the place. And I'm sure that a lot of people would be arguing not for the first sentence, uh, but for the second. But because deserts are inhospitable and sand has scant commercial value, the subdiscipline of dunes had to wait until the 20th century to find a champion. This paragraph is not unusual. It's maybe a little bit higher than what your students could read, but uh, this is a very mainstream paragraph from Smithsonian Magazine. And you'll notice that uh, if your students were looking for the topic sentence as sentence number one, they would be disappointed. They might think all sorts of things that this paragraph is not really aiming to communicate. First paragraph is background, second par or first sentence is background, second sentence is the, uh, the true topic sentence here. There's been a movement lately toward a more realistic view of writing and a more realistic way of portraying writing to our students. And that is really the impulse behind uh, my presentation today. With this new movement, uh, what do we want to tell our students? What can we communicate about uh, this, the structure, the grammar, the vocabulary in uh, topic sentences so that they're looking for what people really do? Um, that's what I mean by realistic here. It's uh, a view grounded in what actual practice is among actual writers in English. Uh, what do English proficient writers actually do? Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't bring up Nigel Kaplan and Ann Johns. Uh, Nigel is one of our authors for the uh, Grammar Newsletter. Nigel always has interesting things to say. Uh, in one of their recent books, uh, one of the recent books that they edited about the five paragraph essay, which as you know, is another staple of writing instruction. They say, we also have to educate administrators and curriculum designers so that they stop constraining teachers to five paragraph essays. This means dispelling the myths of universality, everyone writes them and has always written them, transfer, the training wheel syndrome, scaffolding, it will help them later, and generalization, all students write essays in all their classes. Well, obviously, their their opinion, and I think they've got a lot of good support for this, is that uh, the five paragraph essay uh, is not really what we want to aim for in our writing classes. Um, another topic of the reexamination has been, uh, I never thought I'd say this word, sentencehood, uh, topic sentencehood. And a lot of people have been paying attention to this over the last uh, 20, 30 years. There's not been as much writing as I would like about it because especially when you're researching a presentation like this, you would like there to be a lot more. But uh, if you go online, look at what college writing centers present about this, most of them 
present about the topic sentence in a more realistic way than just saying, oh, it's the first or last sentence of the paragraph. Uh, other important writers on this topic were Richard Braddock, uh, Randall Popkin, and a, an article that I'm going to refer to quite a bit, uh, McCarthy et al., uh, 2008, uh, really interesting uh, empirical research about the topic sentence. Does every paragraph have a topic sentence? That article I was talking about, McCarthy et al., uh, they point out that according to some research by Randall Popkin, that was in the late 80s and early 90s, 50% of the paragraphs in top English journals do not contain clear evidence of topic sentences. And similarly, further back than that in 1974, Braddock found that only 13% of the paragraphs in a corpus of popular magazines contained explicit topic sentences. So not only is it not realistic to say that the topic sentence is always the first or last sentence of paragraph, it's actually only a 50-50 proposition of whether in natural English text uh, in in top English journals. I want to stress here that we're talking about um, academic writing where topic sentences actually are more common than they are in popular writing. Uh, 50, only 50% 50 of the paragraphs even have topic sentences. It's interesting that they make this remark because even while acknowledging that topic sentences are not always present, these researchers and others say that topic sentences and headings should be used more often. They're actual uh, proponents of topic sentences, wishing that topic sentences were used more, but they have to admit that, you know, if you really do go and search through a corpus and look at the, the paragraphs that you've got, uh, you're only gonna find them on average about half of the time. These researchers are saying we need more topic sentences. We need uh, we need to um, increase what we tell students because their writing would be better if they had more topic sentences. Well, on the other hand, uh, Nigel and and John's in their in an interview that they have uh, in uh, Inside Higher Education. You'll see all this in the citations at the end. Um, they say this. Christina Ortmeier Hooper, who has a chapter in our new book, found that high school ESL students who learned the five paragraph essay produced writing that was deemed uncritical or simplistic. And so they were placed in another class that taught the five paragraph essay. Uh, interesting comment. Uh, on the one hand, we've got researchers who want a want writers to be more explicit, but then we have to look at the possible pitfalls in taking on techniques like five paragraph essays or automatic uh, topic sentence placement. Um, because if students write like that, their writing might sound stilted, it might sound simplistic. It definitely doesn't sound as sophisticated and natural as ordinary prose. And so the students might actually while they're trying to be clear, and maybe they are very clear, their writing sounds um, in a way of a lower level, not flexible, not uh, not natural. Uh, we'll see the word naturalistic used later on. Uh, I, I prefer realistic instead of naturalistic. What's interesting is to see how a proponent of the topic sentence who tried to find them and only found them in 50% of uh, the paragraphs, the academic paragraphs that he uh, examined, takes a takes an analytical, analytical look at topic sentence and comes up with uh, four types of topic sentence that actually get, it moves us along. It gets us uh, toward um, a realistic look because if, by analyzing the topic sentence this way, that there, there's the simple topic sentence, which is traditionally the first sentence position and clearly encompasses the entire paragraph. 
But there are other topic sentences too. There's the assembled topic sentences. And I'm a big teacher of this, that very often uh, you, the topic sentence isn't one sentence. Two or maybe even three sentence, sentences work together to fulfill the function of the topic sentence. There is the implied topic sentence, um, which if you do any reading about this, you'll see that people are very, um, they're, they're not really happy with us uh, saying that the topic sentence is implied because if it's implied, where's the actual sentence? There is, either is a sentence or there isn't. I, I would say in an implied topic sentence, there isn't really a topic sentence. There's an implied topic. Um, you have to look at all of the sentences to get the paragraphs point. And then a final point, which is more on a larger discourse level, that uh, the ma a major topic sentence is like the simple kind. It's at the front, but it's meant to summarize a lot of paragraphs. I would call that almost a, a thesis statement for a section instead of a topic sentence. The simple topic sentence is the one that is typically taught to students in ESL and EFL classes. Now, this is a daunting list, I know, but I'm going to leave it up here for a little bit and talk about it because this, I thought, was really interesting research. In all of the time that I've been considering uh, what do we do with topic sentences, I've always thought it would be really nice if somebody did some empirical research and looked at what topic sentences really do and do not contain as opposed to non-topic sentences. And sure enough, McCarthy and his co-writers did this, and this is really interesting. They, uh, their experiments are, are very um, long and involved, and we're not going to be able to talk about them entirely. I urge you to look in the citations section at the end of this presentation and get the citation for this topic or this article because they did a compositional analysis with a computer and they did uh, some intuitional analysis with experienced uh, teachers to try to find out you know, what do topic sentences have, what features do they have grammatically and in terms of vocabulary. They predicted that what they would find uh, in analyzing things through computers and by talking to these experts was that topic sentences would have a lot of adjectives, the main, the highest, the best, the easiest. They would, that the number of words, this is interesting, number of words before the main verb would be relatively high because there is a bridging contrast from a previous claim, a transition. Now, I am, Yay, yay, yay. I am very, very uh, much in favor of teaching students that very often the first sentence of a paragraph, the early sentences, uh, bridge from the previous paragraph. Now, those sentences, I think, might not always be topic sentences, but the bridge function is really important. And when the bridge function occurs, that there is a uh, relatively long structure before you get to the main verb uh, of the sentence. There's a high hypernomy value. Now, hypernomy just means general terms. Uh, for example, tree is a hypernym for oak or pine. There could be a high polysemy value, uh, words like bank or count or some of those real heavy lifting words in English that uh, because they do so much work, have uh, come to have a large uh, or at least a reasonable range of meaning, not just one, that they would include high frequency vocabulary, that they would have existential there, there is, there are, that sort of thing, and that there would be an, a higher incidence of the third person singular S. They were predicting this because they thought Oh, a topic sentence is more likely to be written in the the present tense than in the past, and that of course would generate this grammatical feature. 
For non-topic sentences, they predicted there would be a high incidence of pronouns because it was referring to things that went earlier. Notice once again the assumption that the topic sentence is first. There would be a lot of connectives like in addition to clarifications, for example, the vocab in a non-topic sentence would be very concrete because the topic sentence introduced a larger thing and the uh, support sentences would deal with more concrete things. This is interesting that they would be longer sentences for non-topic sentences. I, I don't know. Uh, cardinal number uh, that they would in non-topic sentences would include uh, two or uh, two, three, four. Um, that is an interesting guess. I I would think topic sentences would include that, but anyway, or that um, non-topic sentences would be uh, would be written in the past tense. Well, anyway, these are the things that they were looking for. They expected their analysis to derive that. Let's move on. What were their conclusions? Well, their conclusions were somewhat contradictory. Uh, by the way, that whole list of things that you find in a topic sentence or the things you find in a non-topic sentence, they actually did confirm the existence of the things that they looked for in topic sentences. And um, those were confirmed um, by both the computational analysis and the uh, intuitional analysis. So, for example, they do say that, yes, it's true. We, when we look at topic sentences, they tend to be more, um, they tend to have a lot of adjectives in them, or they tend to have longer structures before the main verb. Anyway, their conclusion from experiment two, they ran four experiments. In experiment two, they said that both humans and the computational model could distinguish topic sentences from non-topic sentences in a context-free study. Now that means just looking at the sentences on their own, from the structure of the sentence, not from what's around it, because there's nothing around it in this, in this part of the study. There's a sentence alone. Can people and machines identify that as a topic sentence from the features? And they say in experiment two, Yes, they found that because they found the features that they were looking for. It supports what they call a free model of topic sentence. So that is, the topic sentence is a topic sentence, uh, whether it's with other sentences or not. Now, the ontology there is a little bit weird. You have to sort of get kind of meta, but they're basically saying that by by virtue of grammatical and vocabulary features alone, something can be identified as a topic sentence. And if you trace back where it came from, you'd find it acting as a topic sentence. Another thing they found, that given a complete paragraph structure, now here you don't have the sentences on their own, you have them in a context, that um, skilled or knowledgeable readers can process the entire information of a paragraph and will tend to assign topic sentencehood to the first sentence of the paragraph. So they're saying that it's not just something that we teach that topic sentences are, are first. We know they're not always first, but people have a natural tendency to uh, look at the first sentence and call it the topic sentence. Here's another, um, this is rather long, so I'll summarize it for you. What they're, what they're saying is that their fourth experiment shows that some sentences have this innate topic sentencehood through the virtue of their features, but that other sentences are not necessarily identifiable as topic sentences unless you put them in a context. Now, I, I'm not surprised by this, but I do think it has some interesting implications for us because if there is this thing of topic sentencehood based on vocabulary and uh, grammar features, uh, it's important for us to 
find out what those are. And that's what we're going to see in the rest of this presentation. Their overall conclusion was that there are two types of topic sentences, the ideal and the naturalistic. The ideal is sort of like it's the, the kind of topic sentence that we tell that we have traditionally told students to write that uh, in fact they're often used as example ideal topic sentences often used as examples in textbooks um, they're computationally identifiable uh, and they help low skill or low knowledge readers uh, look at and find the topic there are other topic sentences and this is um, these are topic sentences that don't fit the mold so much that unless they're in a context, they're far harder to recognize as topic sentences. That is, they look like any other sentence unless you put them in the context where they clearly are doing topic sentence functions. And that they tend to become topic sentences, that they're not innately topic sentences. They come to be become them as a result of the combination of the reader's recognition of the, dom the domain of knowledge and the positioning of the sentence and other factors that deal with other sentences in the paragraph. So it, it's actually a little bit platonic in a way. Now, I don't want to get bogged down, so we'll move ahead. Um, so let's see. Now, if there are features that um, you can say this is naturally part of a topic sentence, if there are those grammatical and uh, vocabulary features, uh, what are they? Well, if you go online and you look at uh, the advice from writing centers, such as from the writing center at Harvard, um, Elizabeth Abrams wrote uh, on that website, that topic sentences at the beginning of a paragraph frequently combine with a transition from the previous paragraph. That's that bridging function that we talked about. Uh, this might be done by writing a sentence that contains both subordinate and independent clauses. So the complexity of the uh, topic sentence uh, might be a grammatical feature. They might tend to be complex rather than simply compound or simple sentences. And this accords with the expectation by McCarthy that topic sentences would have more words before the main verb. Another uh, comment about the complex sentences, um, Abrams doesn't say this, but uh, I wanted to point it out that material before the main verb, like we were talking about that being relatively long, it might not technically be a clause. Um, so, you know, it's not just a matter of looking for independent and subordinate clauses. It might be some other propositional structure. Uh, Participial phrases, I think, come to mind right away. Uh, look at the sentence, frustrated by this legislative logjam, the governor took several controversial steps. Well, frustrated by this legislative logjam is obviously a participial phrase, not a clause, but it nonetheless carries a proposition and it does pretty much the same thing that a subordinate clause would. Same thing with the next one, being of mixed Ojibwe and Ottawa ancestry, Troutman saw many points of cultural commonality. Um, once again, not actually a clause, but it does the same thing. It uh, stacks up a proposition before you get to the main verb. This could even done, be done with a prepositional phrase. With so little time left on the calendar, the union began an intense email campaign. Well, anyway, from what Abrams said and from what uh, we take from the McCarthy study, uh, this complexity is something that we might want to be able to communicate to our students and communicate it through this variety of structures, not just uh, subordinate clauses, but these participial phrases, prepositional phrases, etc. We'll look again at another point that Abrams made, and it's something that I think you've already noticed, uh, those of you who are writing teachers, if a topic sentence is not the first sentence, it's often a pivot after a concessive. Um, now let's look at an example here. 
Consolidation of healthcare providers may seem beneficial. After all, it distributes money and expertise to smaller locations outside big cities. Now, even if I didn't have this however here, you would be expecting a however or a but or yet or still or something nevertheless. You would be expecting a pivot from one line of thought to another line of thought that's actually the topic of the paragraph. However, the benefits do not outweigh the detriments. What do you expect in this paragraph? Detriments. You don't, you expect this to be a pivot from the earlier uh, ideas, and that's what makes this the topic sentence. This is very, um, a very clear, very mechanical type structure, and students can easily learn this. This is so common, uh, students definitely should be shown that not only are we not having the topic sentence as the first sentence in the paragraph, but it shows this relation to what does come before it. Abrams at Harvard calls these pivot sentences and she says, the pivot always needs a signal, a word like but, yet, or however, or a longer phrase or sentence that indicates an about face. It often needs more than one sentence to make its point. So not only does it pivot like this, you may find a couple of sentences working together to do that. Of course, sometimes a topic sentence is a rhetorical question. Um, I feel bad pointing this out. Um, I know that uh, analysis shows that this is very, very common, but I always teach my, my students to avoid as much as possible uh, writing in questions. It's uh, Maybe it's just a leftover from my uh, work in Malaysia and Singapore where it was just almost universal that they would start a paragraph with a question. But anyway, people do start paragraphs with questions. Abrams uh, points out that questions sometimes in pairs also make good topic sentences. Questions are by definition a form of inquiry and thus demand an answer. Good essays strive for this forward momentum. Here are a couple of examples of pairs of questions. She mentions that they're sometimes pairs. How can a non-expert tell if the job was done right? Can congressional investigators really hold tech companies accountable for actions very few people understand? Well, if this is the topic sentence, or if this is the pair of topic sentences for the paragraph, you know that what's coming next is uh, a detail argument to try to answer these questions. Or here's another example. Now that Jefferson had more than doubled the size of the United States, what should his administration do with it? How could the young US take true possession of Louisiana before Britain, Spain, or other powers pressed their own claims? And I think that your expectations are built up. What will that paragraph do? It will say how the US did try to take of formal possession of Louisiana territory, Louisiana purchase, I should say. And another thing that uh, was expected in McCarthy uh, study, that topic sentences will very, very often have existentials and similar structures. Uh, there is, is a clear existential, but uh, X have been identified does the same thing as an existential, or we have, or can be described. Um, and they're often, they often appear with quantifiers. Notice in these examples, there are, that's the existential, several reasons to prefer porcelain over glass. Quantifier, experts have identified four main ways for hackers to steal your information. Existential-like structure, Quantifier. On Taiwan, some Austronesian languages have been found that do not have Malayo-Polynesian traits. Quantifier, existential-like structure have been found. Not many options currently exist. We don't use exist all that much in this function, but we sometimes do. There's your quantifier. So this is another structure that you can uh, teach to your students that is very typical of topic sentences. Now, I think these would probably come uh, as first or second sentences in most paragraphs. Um, that's, that's fine. 
put them where they belong. Well, I've reached my time here. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for being a great uh, audience. I'm sure you're uh, I'm sure you've been a great audience. I didn't hear any dropping of plates or dogs barking in the background. Um, please feel free to email me if you have any questions and or you would like to talk about this issue. Um, I want to say thank you again to Cambridge for giving me this opportunity. Um, and I urge you all, please read the Cambridge Grammar Newsletter online. It's fantastic. Now, I'm going to switch to uh, my citation slide and just leave it there for a minute. You can take a picture of it with your phone or something um, because it's it's going to take a long time to read. But these are really good citations and I hope that some of you follow up by reading McCarthy at least. And of course, my friend Nigel Kaplan. Once again, thank you all very much. Uh, it was a great pleasure. Bye.